Good morning. We're on passage from Denmark to Sweden and I'm just changing my courtesy flags. That's the easy part of it. Although actually now it's just about all I have to do because so long as we're inside the EU we don't have any formalities at all to deal with. It's easy. You just drive in and that's the end of the matter. It wasn't always like that of course. And um, for many of us, like the Brits, who are not part of the EU, it's not like that now. So, here's my courtesy flag for Sweden, which will do me for when I get in this afternoon. I'll just hitch it up here. Nice long cow hitch on the halyard. There she goes. Pop it on. Good. And the sheep bend on the bottom. The thing is, the customs, if you're travelling between countries that are not associated with each other, it's formality that we all have to deal with. Um, it varies very much from where you are to where you are. If you're in the Caribbean islands, it's a complete pain because each island is its own nation and reasonably enough it wants to control the people who are going in. So you have to clear in and clear out out of each island and if you're going from one to another on a daily basis it takes up half your day and you have to pay money. Well, fortunately, in Britain at any rate, you don't have to pay any money. It comes your way at the popular price but you do have some formalities to, to go through. Exactly what those are, it's not my business to tell you. They change sometimes from day to day as Brexit settles in and, and, and the world comes to its senses. But certain things you've got to have no matter what. You've got to have your passports. It really makes sense to carry some sort of document that proves that you've paid VAT on your boat or that VAT has been paid on your boat one way or another. That's very important. There's all sorts of little things that you pick up, but you pick these up from the, from the authorities in the nation. For example, the RYA will always help you to tell you what you need to take. The Cruising Association, if you're a member of that wonderful organisation, you can just call them and they'll tell you what you need. And that is just such good value. I can't speak too highly of the Cruising Association, actually, in this sort of respect. But um, there are little things that you need to know. For example, in France, you can get fined if your flares are out of date. If you're carrying out of date flares, even, time was, when um, I would keep my flares when they were out of date because they nearly always worked and it was better to have two than one I thought but um, the authorities thought differently so if you've got out of date flares ditch them or huh, don't do that find somewhere where you can dispose of them and so on find out what you need from the authorities now look quite frankly this sort of form filling I find extremely dull but there's a lot of colour to it in fact, and getting round it and dealing with it and some of the characters you meet. So I'm just going to tell you a couple of tales about that. My flag's flying well. I'm going aft. I'll sit down on the push bit and we'll have a chat. Now then, I'm sitting comfortably down aft here in my cockpit. I've taken my shades off because I don't need them back here, I'm looking in a different direction. The light was killing me up there and I always think it's rude to talk to people with shades on, so I've taken them off. I've also got away from the noise of the bow wave. Now, things that used to go on with the customs in the days when we all had to fill out forms, as we do again now. Back in the day, back in the 1970s, when I was a nipper, we used to come back from France in our little boats and we didn't go very fast. These daylight passages just never happened. We always turned up in the dark, usually at the end of a bank holiday Monday. And it'd be two o'clock in the morning, you'd come crawling into the Hamble River and you had to clear customs before you were legally allowed to go ashore. Well, it was a funny situation because it would be very easy to just think, oh, they'll never see me and toddle off. But of course, you couldn't really do that because they might. And also, um, really, they're doing their job, aren't they? So one of us would go ashore, get on the phone and tell them we were there. And along would turn up the customs officer, three o'clock in the morning, eyes propped up with matchsticks. And us, you know, there was a legal, a legal amount of booze you were allowed to bring back. 
and fagged cigarettes and <laughs> it was a matter of principle that you bought more than you were allowed because you weren't allowed much in those days it was ridiculous a lot less than you can have now and so we'd always have an extra bottle or two stashed away and the customs men they knew all about this they couldn't care less they weren't worried about a yachtsman smuggling in a few bottles of wine and we used to sit down around the saloon table with the customs man three o'clock in the morning we'd get the forms out he'd do the forms you'd offer him a drink he'd take a brandy with you and you'd sit there and have a little yarn and then he'd toddle off back to the office and you'd crash out it was a nice arrangement and it worked well things were oddly similar in Norway uh, a long time ago they're pretty tight now in Norway either that or they don't want to see you at all it's hard to know which is which but um, on one occasion I was bound for North America with a big crew and we took on bonded stores that is to say you buy the whiskey cheap you don't pay any duty on it at all it gets sealed in a locker and when you're ready for a drink when you're outside um, home waters you break the bond have a drink and that's all right now when you go into another country the bond will be sealed again so we went into Norway and we had this to say this big crew we we're going all the way to America I had 60 litres of whiskey on board which I had bought in cows at a ridiculously low price £1.50 a, £1 a litre or something madness so you'd be mad not to do it wouldn't you it was all sealed up in the locker we turned up in, in West Norway in Bergen along comes the customs man who looked a very strict and stern fellow and he sat us down he said now have you any drink and we said yeah we, we do because the Norwegians are big on drink especially in those days and they said he said well where is it let's have a look at it and I said well it's bonded it's sealed up they said never mind break the bond get it out I want to know what you've got so we duly dragged out all these 60 litres of whiskey and we planted them all over the saloon table he couldn't see the table for great big bottles of whiskey and the customs man looked at them he looked very strict and he looked at me with a frown and then his gaze sort of softened and he said okay captain when does the party start <laughs> so there you are you see that was a human customs man uh, a less human customs officer was one that I met uh, uh, on a return voyage in an old pilot cutter which I had I'd coming in from far away uh, and we hadn't been in Britain for two or three years and we, we turned up in Yarmouth, Isle of Wight declared ourselves to the customs that we had to clear in and the customs came along now in those days this boat was heated and we've been in the Arctic this boat was heated with a coal stove and we had half a tonne of coal under the cockpit that we kept in there and brought out in nice little bags but of course the bags had broken and it was a bit seriously grubby under there by the time we got home and um, customs one came on board and, and, and she had uh, the customs lady I should say and she had a dog a sniffer dog and she suspected that we were we looked a bunch of hippies we hadn't had an haircut for two months and she decided that we were probably seriously suspicious characters so the dog starts rootling around in the boat and it, she had a lovely white blouse on and she was giving me the, 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 the third degree and the dog went under the cockpit and had a sniff around it came out and didn't find anything of course because we didn't have anything I don't do that sort of thing and um, the dog was so pleased to see its mistress it sort of jumped up a bit and its paws went all over her white blouse so instead of nailing the drug smugglers she went home with her tail between her legs and her white blouse all covered in black coal marks I blessed that dog really because it did bring some humour to the situation but really so that brings me to the final point I'd like to make whatever you do with customs and contraband never ever have anything to do with drugs it's really bad news because even if it's for your own recreational use and as I say I've never partaken it's not my scene but if it's what grabs you and you like a little bit of grass for yourself perhaps just don't do it because if they find it they'll very likely impound your boat and you'll have a devil of a struggle to get it back you may not get it back your boat may end up one of these cheap boats that gets auctioned off at the government sale just don't do it look out for the regulations find out what they are work with them and you'll have a great time sailing the seas <laughs>